All right, uh, good morning once again. Welcome back. All right, welcome back. This is still why in the morning. My good name is uh, Brian Soko. You can find me at uh, Brian Soko 101 on all our social media platforms. And that is, oh, that's mine. <laughs> at Y254 channel uh, for the station and for the programs, hashtag is why in the morning. That's where you can find us. And uh, in this second part of the show, we are going to talk about uh, some of the possible, or rather just exactly, agri-tech solutions and what exactly does it take to be in that uh, space and especially at a day and age where technology is taking over the world by storm and why is it so necessary to have this conversation right now but before we get too far and also before I introduce my guest just to bring a little bit ba uh, uh, to cover base on that uh, there's uh, an interesting report here by Business Inside Africa that says uh, Kenya is the top destination for agri-tech investment in Africa, that is according to uh, FinTech, that says one major factor is responsible for this is the need to solve the country's food security challenges. And then they've outlined uh, an excerpt that says between 2019 and 2022, that is last year, Kenya's leading agri-tech startups uh, rose up to around 80 million. That is, uh, I don't want to mention the exact company there, but they said there are two factors responsible for this. Uh, the first which I mentioned is the, how, how important agriculture is in East Africa and also to our economy as well. And the endless desire to profile a solution to Kenya's food security challenges that has helped to attract investments as well. And then uh, they're also saying, uh, they're also pointing out that there's possible opportunities for the youth, especially right now, because initially how agriculture is marketed in our country is not so attractive, but then how can we make it attractive so that, you know, young people or young minds or millennials and Generation Zs can find it, you know, attractive and more appealing. And joining us live in studio to uh, talk about this topic is uh, Kizito Diambo. He is the CEO of Agribora. He'll tell us uh, what Agribora is bringing on the table and plus how he found himself there. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, just a brief uh, story about how you found yourself in Agribora. Um, so first of all, my background is not in agriculture. I'm an uh, electrical engineer by profession. Okay. And uh, it is more of a necessity that led me into agriculture than really uh, a drive to go into entrepreneurship. So I ended up in agriculture because uh, while I was studying, I was supporting my family back home. Okay. And, uh, you know, one thing led to the other where you realize, OK, I can do more than just send money to help the family do agricultural production. I can actually look at how I can bring in the IT knowledge that I had gained during my uh, studies uh, to help in agriculture. And so I started my first company back in 2014, uh -huh. um, Kedo Solutions, working with smallholder farmers, soybean farmers. And uh, that grew up to 2018, where I transitioned from just working with smallholder farmers in production to looking at how technology can be used to help them improve productivity. So. Uh -huh. I closed down the first company and started the second company, that's now Agribora, mm -hmm. which um, I founded outside of the country uh, mm -hmm. because uh, technology has already um, matured uh, in other countries, especially in Europe where I, had, I studied. So I started my company in Germany and then came to Kenya back in 2019 to now operationalize it. Right. Yeah. But also, uh, reading from your bio, you've worked with so many, uh, let's say, startup uh, agri-tech firms and, uh, you know, the businesses as well. Uh, talk about it and how, you know, it has enabled you to, pro to get propelled into this space. Yeah, so I think because, you know, agriculture from the very first day, we all need agriculture to survive. And um, there is a lot of work that I have done both at a personal level looking at how I can work with uh, smallholder farmers uh, with my first company but also during that process how I can work with other organizations and other companies to bring out the best in agriculture and actually the best on agriculture is very simple increase productivity yeah. and improve product profitability so how do right. you make that work for smallholder farmers right. so when you look at agriculture, you have uh, the producer organizations, you have across the value chain, not just the smallholder farmer, but uh, the plowing service providers, the input providers, you have the off takers, the aggregators, the agri processors. So across this value chain, you realize that you have a lot of engagement opportunities, yeah. which can leverage on one, 
everything that the farmer is making, but no. it requires technology to help it become more efficient and yeah. actually more scalable. Yeah. Now, um, I had mentioned initially how agriculture is presented, even in adverts. It's not as the most beautiful advert ever you'd ever watch in, in anywhere mm -hmm. in, in digital. How can we make it so appealing and so easy for especially the Generation Zs now, or millennials, so that you know, once they see an agricultural advertisement, even a job itself, a lot of people wouldn't want to go down that direction because they think it's more handy, it's more dirty. But like you mentioned, it seems like it's, it's, it's one of the most lucrative spaces mm -hmm. ever. And even as the adage goes, in our, in our country, we say that agric agriculture is the backbone of yeah. our country. And like you said, to increase the value chain, food production and profitability are the main co-ingredients. Mm -hmm. How can we make it so appealing to the young minds? So when I started Agribora, the, the main goal was to make um, smallholder farmers more visible, right. more accessible, and more bankable. And right. so those are the three main pillars of the work that we do. And I'll explain right. why the youth have an actually very sweet spot in that. Because right. what we try to do is to balance human touch and technology. Now, mm -hmm. We all remember agriculture, the days of our grandparents and parents where it was about taking a djembe and going to the field and working so hard until right. you escape the midday sun and then you come back in the afternoon. You know? Was it a djembe or a hoe? Or a hoe, you know, all these, let me say, still um, traditional ways of uh, producing yeah. or for crop production. Right. Today, uh, if you look at why the youth should engage into, in agriculture, it's not because you want them to also get a hoe right. and go to, uh, to the field. Um, right. The Africa Development Agenda 2063 foresees that we want to do away with the hand hoe by 2025. Right. That is what the Africa Union was hoping to do. We are now already right. in 2023 and we are yet to achieve that. Right. So how do we make it work for the youth? Well, it is looking at the job opportunities that are in the agriculture sector that right. not necessarily require you to go and toil the hard soil. Right. It's looking at how you can leverage on technology. Let's talk yeah. about um, the different stages of crop production. Just from, I need to know the, I need to know the, um, the, the quality of my soil so right. that I can be able to determine which crop to plant and which fertilizer to use. So what do right. you need to do? You need to do soil testing. Right. Um, back in the day, you would carry your soil test, send it to one of the government offices. It takes a month to come back, if at all it does. Right. Today, you can have an, uh, you know, a sensor gadget which can be able to measure your soil within five minutes. Yeah. And so the opportunity that you have is for you to equip somebody, a youth for example, right. with this device, which is not very expensive, and right. they can be able to move through uh, the, 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 the county or at the ward level and yeah. actually provide these services. So it's actually becoming more about service provision mm. to the agriculture sector and not now the youth being the ones to uh, toil the land. And right. at the end of the day, with the mechanization that is coming in, you actually have smaller tractors and smaller planting machinery, which then need, require you to use less of human labor right. and actually more of these technologies. And so right. if you look at the opportunities for youth, it is in the service provision, it is in how they can fit into the value chain and right. provide this value to farmers and then of course the end market. All right. Uh, you mentioned uh, soil testing, which I believe that's when soil science comes in. Yeah. And now you're coming in as a, an expert now, especially for you. Yeah. But then there are so many components in there that includes like agri, agri tech, agri fintech. Yeah. Uh, do you mind just sharing some of the uh, possible opportunities in there before we get to how can we commercialize it so that anyone else who is in the interiors can even become part of it? Yeah. So. Agritech as, you know, as a word is quite broad. So if you look at all the technologies and what, what does agritech basically mean? It means how do you solve agricultural challenges with right. technology? technology right. It's that way, it's not the other way around. It's not what cool things can I do with technology and bring it into agriculture? Because there's right. also a lot of that in the market, right? right? So you're looking at, so what are the problems in the agriculture space right. that would require technology to solve? Now, let's yeah. to talk about, we've talked about production, because production right. is the first level. Yeah. Decision making about what to grow. Right. Talk about crop suitability. We are looking right. at climate change. We're looking at the 
different ecological zones in the country. So right. why should I grow sugarcane in Western Kenya and not in Eastern Kenya? Right. right. So that you have a very good reason for advising a farmer right. what to try. Right. So these decisions already at that point of just deciding what to grow you have yeah. crop suitability where you have technologies such as um you know data science analytics which help you to analyze climate change and variance soil suitability and all that then yeah. once you've made a decision about what you'd want to grow based on the suitability of that field right. you then look at what can I then grow in this particular field? And right. then now you're talking about soil testing, as I have mentioned, to help right. you to decide which, um, you know, do you have enough organic matter? Do you need fertilizer? We're talking about subsidy schemes. Right. Where do you provide this subsidy? It's not a blanket cover for all that you say, okay, as an organization or as a government, we give each farmer two bags of DAP and one bag of CAN. That's right. not, it's not that simple. Right. right true. And so technology can help us solve that problem. Right. And uh, we have decided, you know, we have already known what the soil looks like. We know which seed and fertilizer to use. Look at seed uh, multiplication, which right. seed to use. Uh, you know, we are no longer using the seeds we used in the 80s, in the 90s. Uh, technology has helped us to be able to produce more drought resistant uh, crops, more early maturing crops. We are talking about uh, genetic modification, which is also a big topic in the society at the moment. So yeah. all this is technology and where you can look at bioscience and how that affects um, agriculture. Yeah. And so we have decided what to grow. I've talked about machinery, that you don't need to buy yourself a big combined harvester and a big tractor to actually plow your one acre piece of land. Right. You also no longer need to, de to depend on you know, the cow to actually pull an oxen or something. Right. So. Um, those are some of the opportunities already just before you even put your seeds into the soil. Right. Now, once the seeds are in the soil and you have prayed and you probably want or you want to actually decide when to plant, right? You're looking at the weather predictability is very different right now. Yeah. We no longer plant on the 15th of March and harvest at the end of June as we have been doing earlier right. on. So right. weather predictions, looking at when is the onset of rains, it is no longer very predictable, but that is now where science is coming in. The yeah. meteorologists are really working hard. You know, We have more data points at the moment, so weather stations, we're talking about IoT devices that can be put out to be able to identify the right soil moisture conditions to enable you to actually start planting. So there we're talking about weather stations, um, drone imageries that can actually be able to help you assess what the level of soil moisture is, and then are you able to plant or not. And once you've been able to plant, most of us think we just need to start praying to God and right. wait for three months and see what happens. But there's right. just so much you can do at that point, if, you, if, if, uh, if I'm not taking too much time. Because once the seeds are in the soil, and yes, we should pray and hope for a bounty harvest, we can actually start tracking crop development. Right. Satellites, which are out in space, can detect pests and diseases two weeks earlier than the naked eye. Right. Which means if you wait to check if you have a pest or a disease on your field, you might be too late. Right. But if you depend on such technologies that can actually analyze um, the chlorophyll matter that can analyze the crop and can actually help you detect, hey, look out for this, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, problem. Mm -hmm. You can be able to then invest in this, uh, in this technology. So you're looking right. at all these different ways where technology comes in. So you're talking about machine learning, data science, IoT, drone technologies, which can all come in. And of course, when you look at the market side, you can now look at how applications can be used to help farmers link to markets and right. so on. Yeah, uh, you've given quite a, a broad explanation, but uh, before we get back uh, to that, when you, when you look at the rate of rural to urban area migration, especially in this day and age, it seems like a lot of people prefer to go and work in an office mm -hmm. because people are, are, are now studied and informed. Somebody would prefer to go and get a job yeah. as a, a TV producer, as a finance uh, accountant somewhere, whatever. But then uh, who are the people remaining in these mm -hmm. areas that can practice this agriculture we're talking about yet? We are here talking about some of the possible solutions mm -hmm. bringing in technology. Is, is, is it that maybe uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a time where we should now tell people to like, 
it's now time to go back to where you come from. Mm -hmm. Go back to your village and now start practicing agriculture. Because at this point, yes, even when you we talk about the cost of living, yeah. uh, I remember the president has constantly been vocal saying, uh, what were Rudy Kwa Mashamba or Lima instead of, you know, going to the Manda Manda? Yeah. And they gave uh, fertilizer subsidies. But now, at, at, at what point should we start having this conversation that, yes, it's okay to be in the urban areas, but please, at least go and start, you know, yeah. practicing agriculture. You know, the funny thing is, uh, you know, we all live um, that hope that there's a better tomorrow. And so anybody who lives uh, the rural area trying to look for better perspectives in the urban areas, you know, they're just trying to see a brighter future for themselves. We see this escalate until some people decide to leave their countries going and, you know, migration outside of their countries of origin to other countries, sometimes to other continents. But at the end of the day, when you look at how many graduates are uh, really languishing, <laughs> You know, are in the cities, yes, but uh, they do have a degree in their pocket, but are doing jobs that do not actually require a degree to do, right? Yeah. Then you or not even what they studied for. What they yeah. studied for. You know, right. you did engineering, but you're actually uh, working in a restaurant or something. Sim or, you know, okay. you, are, you are supposed yeah. to be a teacher and right. now you are uh, you're doing something that is completely different because right. you're just not getting these opportunities. So one, right. it's to realize that there is no that greener pastures dream of saying, you know, just move to the urban areas and you will get the job because those jobs are yet to exist. Okay? Right. And, uh, you know, we see that when we, are, when we advertise for job opportunities, the number of people that apply for just one single position, right. you know, it's, it's ridiculous, right? It's really ridiculous. And so how do we convince the youth? Because it's really a matter of convincing people to look at the opportunities that are in the rural area. Yeah. And I think it's not, it's not dangling the carrot of technology before them and saying, hey, you can be a superstar with technology, go back and use it in your farm. Right. It's looking at what is the job opportunity and what is the return on investment for you. So right. if you were to invest today in uh, buying a thresher, for example, yeah. okay, maybe you can fabricate that here locally for maybe 200, 300,000 uh, shillings. And what do you do with it, right? You don't want to sit at home and look at it. You want to get jobs. And right. that is now where digital savviness helps you to say, hey, there is this application where farmers can be able to request for this. And it's not a mobile application that needs, uh, you know, internet. It can also be used via USSD. So that right. because your average farmer or our average farmer on our platform, and we have over 80,000 at the moment, is uh, around 55 years old. That's our average farmer. And so our question every day is, if that is the farmer we are serving, right, uh, at what point does the youth come in, right? And uh, we say, so that average farmer at 55 years needs a very, very simple technology, probably USSD based or IVR, SMS, for them to do something that is actually very, very difficult. Now, technology, if you really want to know a sophisticated technology, you see the solutions that are simplest. The one that they just tell you, press a button and something happens. That is the most complicated technology because right. what happens under the hood is really fascinating, right? right? So getting a farmer to just request a thresher via SMS or yeah. USSD is really complicated right. because that youth will now get it on a mobile application and then they can service that, uh, that activity. And the question is, how many of these farmers do you require for right. you to actually make uh, you know, a decent income out of it? So okay. I think it is exposing the opportunities and talking more from the numbers perspective, how much do you stand to make uh, in a month, in a right. season? And so you've heard about these gig opportunities that we talk about in urban areas. We say, yeah, gig opportunities in writing texts and you know, uh, reviewing some material. Right. But gig opportunities in agriculture is actually where you can create a lot of employment because right. there is a lot of work. Just from the day I've mentioned, you need to decide what to plant and yeah. the day you're taking your crop to the final off taker. Right. There are a number of opportunities for the youth and it cannot be done by one person. Right, and sure. you need a bit of investment, but also looking at what is the return on investment. So I think that's the which way is, to go. Which is like the main goal. Like if I do this, well, how am I profiting? Yes. Getting profit. 
that's that that's at the end of the day you know what my how what do I, what am i left with at the end of the day and so right. the model that we have uh, developed as agribora is we realize that you know we have all these over 5 million smallholder farmers across kenya and technology will never reach these farmers. Technology might bring the information to them or make it easier for them to access this information, but there is right. no day our technology will go and visit them. Right. So there is always the need to have this human touch. Right. And so we have this model that we call the AgriHub. Right. So all these last mile service providers in the villages, in the rural areas that right. are working with farmers, we are right. equipping them with the right technology to make right. their work easier. And so we, quantify our success not just by the number of farmers we have reached but by the number of job opportunities we are creating for businesses right. to actually reach their farmers and okay. that way you can actually see oh i have uh, five youth who have been just picking geo coordinates or sending uh, you know doing spraying providing spraying services to farmers and yeah. they have earned this amount just this week so okay. my question is can i give them another another engagement next week and they Answer is yes. Why? Because you have the right technology to actually pinpoint what a farmer is doing at what time and who may require your services. Right. True. Interesting. Uh, you'll also talk about later on how agri-tech can be used to solve some of this global warming slash climate change mm -hmm. uh, problems. But now let's let's get back to the interior. Of course, uh, when you when you look closely, uh, especially in the interiors, you realize there's something. Uh, I know you understand about crop rotation, mm -hmm. but then that the, 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 there's a need to break that cycle. Instead of planting maize each and every year, yeah. try find another alternative uh, crop to yeah. plant. But you realize that in most of those interiors, they're, they're like it's only maize or sugarcane. Yeah. To increase our food productivity, what are some of the other possible, uh, uh, let's say, alternatives, especially in the interiors, that maybe will not even get this conversation. But uh, just in case somebody lands here, they yeah. can tap into that and help them. Yeah, I think crop diversification is one of the critical points that need to be addressed if we are to become food secure as a country and equally as a continent. Yeah. Now, the reason why we grow maize is it's simple. It's what our parents and our grandparents and great grandparents have done. So it's it works. Tradition. You know, it works. It, if uh -huh. I can't sell it, I'll eat it. Right. So it's very simple and um, it is easy for us to basically work with it and pray and hope that it, uh, it comes out. Right. It is more challenging to actually decide to move into a high value chain crop. Why? Okay. Because one, it requires higher investment. Right. There is more risk to it. Why? Because you have the risk of pests and diseases that you are not aware of. You right. have the risk of not actually identifying the, the market. You have the right. risk of uh, post-harvest handling and losses that come in. Right. With maize, you know, you are able to sort of, you know, we are all risk averse in a way. And so a smallholder mm. farmer is the most risk averse person right. that will say, okay, Worst case scenario, I will eat this and my children will not go to bed hungry. And if yeah. I have anything left, I will then try and sell it out there. Right. But how do we expose the opportunities in higher, uh, high value chain crops yeah. and in the structured ecosystem? Because you see, every time we talk about farming, we talk about maize on the one right. hand, because yeah. it is, you know, it's the, it's the main crop and, and the main stain, right? Uh, but apart from that, we talk about tea, we talk about coffee, we talk right. about sugarcane. All right. the woos in Western Kenya with the sugar companies and then we look at the tea subsidies and coffee. Right. That is what we talk about most of the time when we talk in the agriculture space. We, right. leave a lot, we leave out so many other crops that are high value. Talk about Irish potatoes, talk about tomatoes, talk about um, you know, um, herbs and spices. Uh, talk about soybean, sorghum, all these crops that could actually have a better, fetch a higher value. So I think one of the things at that point in how we can be able to improve diversification is to actually support, um, support um, opportunities for farmers to come and learn about these new ventures, but give them opportunities to actually grow, which means, one, you need to be able to help them access the finance right. and then the information to grow these crops. Right. Because uh, moving away from maize and doing something else like sunflower, for example, is right. expensive. 
Yeah. Right? Uh, setting up a greenhouse is expensive. And so right. while you might want farmers to uh, go into new crops, there yeah. is that fear. And that first mover fear is still there for them. So Also, sometimes the soil, you're not sure how the soil will respond. Yes. Yes, in case you don't have the knowledge about soil science or dance yeah. soil testing. And that is now where technology comes, comes in, in, where you just do crop, uh, you know, you, you have this uh, crop suitability maps. Uh, yeah. Carl Rowe from the Ministry of Agriculture has developed a very extensive crop suitability map for the country where you can pick your GPS location. Right. And it basically suggests to you, given your conditions, given the climate at this point, given the soil The fertility right as right. well. And right. did you know that, you know, from satellite data, we can actually know the composition of soil at right. a 30 meter resolution. Right. So you do not need to go and test your soil already at that point to actually right. know what to grow. Or take it to some lab in the government. Already, <laughs> right you now we can that. tell you what is the composition of soil in Tarakanithi. Right. And so we know this soil Via is good GPS for this, satellite. just from satellite data. Okay. And so all this is technology that has been developing mm -hmm. where you can actually talk to the county governments because now agriculture is also in a way a devolved uh, activity. Right. You can talk to the county governments and advise the county governments to focus on specific crops that are not maize. Okay. That is why you see, you know, you have a lot of avocados coming from this area, coffee right. from another area, which right. is good, yeah. right? So you can be able to actually have a policy to enable you grow specific industries in your region so right. that you can focus on doing sorghum or sunflower in yeah. those areas that commercially are doing. Now. commercially okay yeah. i want us to take a very short break uh, but when you come back you'll be expounding more on that as well as how how is the government you know plugging in to ensure that this conversation continues to sink and sink further to the interior so we'll be back after a short uh, break on the hashtag why in the morning stick around